Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, everybody. I've got a great one for you today. Uh, you might want to slip on your uh, Lululemons or whatever your spandex is because we're talking about adaptive yoga and how my guest uses that with memory care residents. So help me welcome Stacy Wyatt. Thanks for joining us, Stacy. Thank you so much for having me. So Stacy reached out to me about what she's doing with yoga, and I've had conversations about yoga for stress release for caregivers. She's going to tell us how she uses it to help maintain some cognitive ability and some and mobility and stability in people that are living with some form of dementia. So why don't you give us your background, Stacy, and then we'll talk about how the listeners might be able to incorporate some of your techniques with their loved one. If Perfect. Voice works. <laughs> Perfect. Okay. So my background came, gosh, in my early thirties, I I was just sort of what I call my great wake up. I had a child with a disability. I have a child with a disability. She'll be 30 soon. And I was really angry. I, it wasn't what I thought was my life was going to be like. I had two boys and then here she comes. And so I had a lot of uncertainty about the future, a lot of present day. This is really tough. And so I was really angry um, for a long time. And somebody suggested to me, a couple of things. One, a gratitude practice, which I thought was silly, but definitely changed my life. And then also to try yoga for stress relief. And, and I didn't like it at first. It was something I wasn't interested in at all. I, I hated it. I arrived late. I left early. I didn't like it. And about 10 classes in, I was forced at the front of the room and I, I had to stay for the whole thing. And it kind of clicked in me that there was something, something better than what I had been experiencing in my day to day that I could find through the yoga practice. So started my own kind of wake up through yoga, the lifestyle more than the postures. I, I believe that our Western world really focuses on what the physical body does. And I was looking for something more. And I realized like about two years into this, that this might be a great bridge for my daughter and I to find common ground. And she was about eight, nine, 10 at the time. So I took some training on using yoga as a complementary modality to occupational therapy, speech therapy, physical therapy for kiddos with multiple disabilities. And I loved it so much, came home from the training, ready to roll with my girl. And she was like, no, thanks. We're not doing that. We are not doing that. And so Typical kids. Yeah. And, and I thought, well, there's still something yearning me towards this population that maybe isn't for my daughter, but maybe there's something more. So I became a yoga teacher and, and then went back to the same training to learn how to work with adults. Cause I felt there's this population of people in our community that can't walk into core power yoga they don't have the money. They don't have the ability. They have all these barriers and took the training, came home empowered. I went to my local um, therapeutic rec program through our city. We have like recreation programs, people play softball, and then they have this sector that's for adults with disabilities. And I said, I want to do this. I know it works. I know I can do this. And so I volunteered for four years once a week teaching yoga to people that were wheelchair bound anywhere from 18 years old all the way up to elderly mingled in with some developmental disabilities eventually the program got so big we had to kind of separate developmental and physical and it happened that a news station did a feature of the therapeutic rec program on a yoga day and somebody saw it in the community that works with um, low-income seniors and they reached out to me and sort of the rest became history. I began contracted work with low-income seniors with multiple diagnoses. And under that umbrella of that company, they also had a brain injury program with five residential programs, homes for people with brain injuries. And so that became a huge passion point for me. Somebody's living an everyday life like you and I, and then an event happens and their life's completely different. And so 
became a brain injury specialist because I wanted to understand trauma on the brain, addiction in the brain, changing brains, which sort of led me down the dementia path. And a lot of my students with traumatic brain injuries are also developing dementia as they progress through their life because of the trauma to the brain. So um, when the pandemic happened, everything stopped in my world. I went completely virtual, was teaching across the country in group homes, assisted livings virtually like this really hard, but it worked. And then when things reopened again, I wanted to get back in front of people and I didn't want to be in a yoga studio. I have rarely taught in them. I can do it. I have my own little studio that I teach typical people in, but I really am passionate about taking yoga to places that the people can't go to the YMCA. They can't go to a rec center. They, whatever their barrier is, it could be that they're incarcerated or they're homeless or they're living in assisted living with dementia. And that sort of just became my business model is I was going to go to them. And so I'm currently contracted with seven different agencies serving over 50 assisted living homes, hmm. hundreds of people. I'm, I'm all over the state of Colorado, like Denver, Colorado Springs. I'm in my car. I'm seeing four to five homes three times a week sometimes five times a week, I ring the doorbell, the staff opens the door and we, I walk in and we're doing a yoga practice in a living room where everybody's in their recliners with their fleece blankets on, or they're sitting around the dining room table and, and it works and it, it, it's magic to see how they light up when they're given something that, that ignites their brain based on their life history. And I found that the major like teaching points for my style of adaptive yoga, which, you know, I'm not just adapting a traditional yoga practice to somebody in a recliner. I'm going around the bend and kind of putting physical body stuff aside. And how do I connect with somebody? How do I improve their posture so they're getting more oxygen to their brain and they're more alert and that their focus is better, their memory is better, their appetite's better. How am I Im embedding gratitude, you know, for those students of mine that are, you know, confused, early diagnoses, why am I living here? I want to be home. Let's pull in some gratitude for what we see out the window today. We see spring is coming and there's birds and sky. And so I really, I feel like when I explain to adaptive yoga to somebody, especially a yoga teacher, they don't quite understand, like, what do you mean you're not doing a sun salutation? Not so much. I mean, we move the body, but I believe four principles have to be incorporated in a class. And this could be for a typical person. It could be for somebody who's a quadriplegic, who I'm moving their body for them. Somebody with end-stage frontal lobe dementia who can only communicate through their eyes, they all get the same four things. And that's connection, breath, movement, and gratitude. And if I don't do those four things, then it's time for me to go. And I don't want to be teaching exercise. I, I don't want to, I just want to do that. So I bring those four principles into every class. And, and, I, and then as far as the movement part, I pull their history. And for a lot of the women, I, I tell a story that I need help baking a cake. Can you help me? I don't know how to do this. I make up a lot of stuff. And we get the arms moving and we're stirring a cake. And I'm like, I don't know what goes in a cake. And there are always little pockets of individuals that remember flour, sugar, butter, chocolate. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we do flour, butter, sugar, chocolate, and then let's make frosting with the other hands. And somebody says, well, you need sugar and you need butter and you need vanilla. And so pretty soon what's happening is I'm crossing that midline. Both arms are working, crossing, you know, the brain's going crazy up here, activating neurons, stimulating something. They feel amazing because they're remembering something that's important to them that has value, especially for the women who were homemakers for their life career. We roll out pie dough. We do so many things that's familiar. They don't realize they're moving. 
<laughs> that they're doing yoga, but they're connecting to themselves first to feel empowered that they're not crazy, they're not worthless. And then there's community between the residents because they're laughing that it should be a strawberry cake or it should be a chocolate cake. And <laughs> there's something that's happening that's not related to watching the uh, Price is Right. There's mm -hmm. something active in the present moment that's bringing people together. And that's what I want to do is bring people together between themselves and then with, with the people they're living with. And then what's really cool is the staff are over here in the kitchen and they're making lunch and they're witnessing, you know, so-and-so talking about making a cake. And then there's memories that come from that. And they had no idea that this resident has the potential to communicate, recall, engage, because they're so used to just hanging out with prices, right? And that's what I've seen really cool is that the staff also gets excited because they're seeing their residents doing more than what they thought they could do. So, and then for the gentlemen, because men don't necessarily bake cakes. No, so not I, generally. Not generally. So what I did was I got a screenshot poster of referee signals for football. And I learned that a touchdown looks just like mountain pose. And a field goal looks just like cactus pose. And so I have a series of referee signals that get the men engaged in moving their body. And especially during football season, it's a big hit. And their homework is when they watch football on Sunday, they have to do the signals. And because it's repetitive and it's something that they recognize as a familiar thing, they're more likely to engage with it than if I just came in as a flighty yoga teacher and said, we're going to do a sun salutation now, take a breath. Like, that's just not going to work. So I've made it work fabulously. Well, that was going to be my question. Is yoga in general mind-body connection practice, correct? Yes. Okay. Because I do do some yoga. I would definitely like it more in a recliner with a fuzzy blanket, but... <laughs> <laughs> might be a, exactly. I might be a little beneath my skill level. <laughs> um, so I was going to ask, like, because I know the classes that I do. So I, I have a Peloton. I, I, my listeners know I'm a, I belong to the cult of Peloton. And, you know, there's a lot of concentration on posture. Like, are you in the right pose? Like, is your pose correct so that you don't hurt yourself or fall over and I was like, I don't know how anybody like my mom would manage that, but now you've explained it. So that's, and it's seated pretty much. Yeah, it's always seated be, because I feel like inclusion should be um, one of the forefronts principles of my business. I don't want somebody who happens to be in a wheelchair be limited because everybody else gets to stand up. I So for like my brain injury population, we're always seated, even if it's, um, 90% able-bodied, if that one person's in a wheelchair, I just don't feel that we need to exclude somebody because their life experience is different. So I typically do it in a chair and I, and I feel like chair yoga, there's so much, like there's just so much you can do. It's a little bit hard in a recliner to work the lower body, but we go for a walk in nature and I get them marching and I have a sequence that's nature-based. Um, I'll ask them what their favorite tree is, which you know, I might have to give some clues, you know, remind them like elm tree, aspen tree, pine tree, Christmas tree. And I always get an answer, but I bring things that are familiar into the physical practice, the postures. Definitely there's no yoga language happening. It's very um, English-based and touch-based. I do a lot of hand-holding I'll do hand over hand if somebody isn't quite sure what that looks like for their body, always asking permission and all of that. But, but I feel like they're hungry for human touch. That's not clinical. And if I can sit with somebody and our yoga practice is I rub their feet or I rub their hands and we talk about what's important to them, we're having an amazing yoga practice because the definition of yoga is union. And if I'm in union with that other person, then we're having a great moment. So um, when somebody comes and says, am I doing it right? My question is always, how does it feel in your body? 
because what's right for me is going to feel very different than what's right for you. And I encourage it to be sensation based on, on them. So I might have them just hug themselves for a second. And where do you feel that in your body? In my back, my shoulders, my arms. And then we go around the circle so that each person gets to maybe share that they feel it in their elbow. That's right too. There's no wrong way to do it. As long as you're feeling a sensation, it's right. And do you, what do you do when you get pushback? Because my mom was, she was resistant to a lot of stuff. Yeah. And it was frustrating because it's like, why does this work for everybody else? And I'm like failing at getting you to connect with me this way. Yeah. And I feel like a lot of times um, my initial response, I ring the doorbell. I am Stacey, the happy yoga teacher. A lot of times I'll get pushback from staff initially like, oh, they're not going to do it. And I say, just give me a chance. Please just give me a chance. And I come in to the space and I talk to them. And a lot of the ways, my favorite way to engage somebody who's usually like, I'm not doing that silly yoga, is I get really close to them and I talk about their blanket. Oh, this fleece, you know, blanket is so beautiful. Can you look at me for a second? And they'll look at me and I'll say, I need to see what color your eyes are. And so I get really close and then I say, wow, your eyes are blue. Mine are green, don't you think? And so then all of a sudden, they're out of their resistance mode and they're figuring out what color my eyes are. Or I might have um, like this blouse on. I'll say, I don't know. What do you think about this? I'm not really into flowers. Tell me what you think. I talk to them as if they're fully cognitively intact. There's never any like shouting at them as if they're deaf or, you know, talking to them like a child. I just walk in like I'm, you know, the neighbor down the street bringing cookies and I need your help with something. And usually when I approach them as I need your help versus you need to do this, this is going to be good for you. Like that's not my place to tell somebody else what's good for them. But if I ask for their help, then they're more likely to say, okay, so I use aromatherapy a lot, which is a huge trigger for memories. And I'll say, you know, I can't figure out what this is. Can you smell this for me? They don't know that it's not, you know, that it's labeled. I could read it, but can you just tell me what this reminds you of? Because I think it's lemon, but I, it's just not right. Can you tell me what this might be? And then that gets conversation going again. And I think when the resistant person, I'm not doing silly yoga, sees that other residents are having fun, they're smiling, they're laughing, they're experiencing aromatherapy, somebody's touching their hands, somebody's getting really close to them and giving them goodness they're they might just like it they might say hmm maybe I want to do that and I try to tell people like well, what do you do I'm I don't want to say I'm a yoga teacher I certainly am qualified to be called that but what I really want to be is the giver of goodness and I just give goodness. And that's how I kind of reel them in. Men are very resistant because they think that's just like crazy girl stuff. But, you know, I'm engaging. I ask them what color my eyes are. I hold their hands. If they have a wedding ring on, I comment on that. Or I say, wow, you have working hands. What did you do for work? And you must have been a strong worker. And I'm reeling them in. And I will tell them, you know what? We just do a great yoga practice because we had a conversation and then they, they drop that barrier that it's, you know, for bendy people, or you have to be on the floor or it's for girls. They soften their edge. And, you know, I, I have good charisma with the gentlemen. I'm able to like pull them out of that resistance and women too, like just to give her of goodness. And I, I would love for other people to kind of tag along with me. I mean, that's my big mission is there are people in every single community in this country, in the world that would benefit from this type of yoga. And it's not just adapting traditional yoga to a chair. It's putting that aside and connecting with people. I would love to teach more people how to do this, but it has to be something that you have the heart for. You have to be able to put aside some of the discomfort that comes when you're dealing with Alzheimer's and dementia and the outbursts and the tears and the shutdown and 
everything that happens, put it aside and just connect with that person at the spirit level and it'll be fine. And so I'm really trying to market other yoga teachers or occupational therapists, counselors, that they could do this. And it would be not only incredibly fulfilling for the residents, but it has changed my life. Every day I get in the car thinking, I get to do this today. Not that I have to do it, but I get to do it. And I want other people to feel that. Not everybody will, but if I could find some people that could go into their small town and knock on the door, it would just, it would be amazing. Is there a way to, besides talking to people like myself, to help train family caregivers? Because this, I had one thing in mind before we started talking and now it's like, wow, I'm really intrigued and um, I'm impressed because it's not, it's not what I was thinking it was going to be, but I really, I'm really, I don't, I don't really have the word. I'm inspired by what you're doing, I guess is the thought. And so my thought is, is there's gotta be a way of teaching, like doing a retreat and teaching caregivers or something. Mm-hmm. That would be my thought. I recently, like I got so inspired, you know, in being out with my hip surgery, not being able to be in front of my people, as I call them, they're mine. (laughs) I love them so much. And so I started, you know, I have a YouTube channel that I've had since the pandemic. And so I, I started to create some YouTube videos, yoga for dementia, so that they're short and sweet, kind of give the technique of the cake and frosting, give the technique of the nature based sequence, like this month in April. I'm asking them, what would you plant in your garden that is in your heart? Patience, love, acceptance. We're going to start with the seed. We're going to bloom the seed. We're going to grow the seed. We're going to scatter the seeds. We're going to grab more seeds and return that back to our heart. So we start with love. We grow love. We spread love. We return love. And each individual gets a chance to talk about what they want to grow in their own heart. And depending on where they are in their journey, of memory care, they may need a lot of prompting. So I use visual cards, little smiley faces, or I have a list of, you know, these are things other people are growing, love, patience, kindness. And they'll usually answer. And if they don't, I'll say, you know what I think you should grow? You should grow beauty because you're so beautiful. And so that, oh, so we grow <laughs> beauty. And and so I just did a view- video yesterday on YouTube of that seed sequence that's intention-based that everybody could, you and I could say, what do I want to grow this season? Tolerance, patience, acceptance, and how do I take that and give it to others and then return it back? And that's when we're living yoga is when we're taking something that we want to be a better version of ourselves. And when we're dealing with a diagnosis that's hard. We're away from our family. We're confused. We don't understand why we can't open the door. It's so different. And yet, if Sunshine Stacy comes in and just gives a little goodness, their day is better. So because I'm not able to reach my people right now as I'm healing, I thought I'd do some YouTube videos. And so, you know, caregivers may be able to just pop on that YouTube and say, oh, my mom would like that, or my dad would love the football series or or whatever. And, and really what the yoga word needs to kind of go away. I don't want to devalue it because it's the principles in which I live my life, but the physical part of yoga needs to be set aside for a little bit. And how can I engage people? I will often just take their hands and just pull them a little bit. And do you feel that in your shoulders? Now pull me, you pull me. And for somebody who's strong and I know they don't have physical stuff, I'll sit on the floor and say, can I have your hands? Can you pull me up? And they're using strength to pull me. And then I'll say, okay, I'm going to pull you forward. Now they're getting a forward bend that's assisted by me. So there's tactile touch of love coming through me to them. They get a stretch and I'll say, tell me where you feel that in my back, pull me up. And so we row, row, row the boat a few times that can be enough movement. And so if a caregiver can do that for somebody who's been sitting in a recliner all day and their back hurts, but they can't tell anybody their back hurts because they can't identify where their pain is, just move them. So I think there's the potential for caregivers to pour in that same sort of philosophy 
through the lens of yoga, which is just union and goodness. I think it's, it's the potential's great. No, it makes sense. Especially like, I know there's days when at the end of the day, it's like, my body just feels like this wadded up piece of paper. It's like all crumpled up. It's like, everything is tired and not, not necessarily achy, just tired. And then it's like, yeah. I know if I go and do a 20 minute evening stretch, which sounds to the, to the average person probably sounds like an interminable amount of time is <laughs> amazing how fast that 20 minutes goes by. Yeah. Your whole body feels so much better. And the evening stretches are actually designed to wind down your nervous system to prepare you to sleep. And I have yeah. learned, <laughs> turn the bed down, wash your face, brush your teeth, get everything ready. Cause as soon as you're done with that stretch, you're going to want to lay down and zonk out for yeah. the night. Um, but when I don't do that, it's like, ugh, you know, just like you get into bed and you just, ugh, everything feels tight and cranky <laughs> and, you know, so yeah. obviously somebody that can't communicate that I like the rowing. Cause I'm thinking that that would feel really good on your shoulders. Especially because yeah. if you're seated a lot, you know, you're in the forward hunched over position. You, gotta, sure. you have to do the reverse flexion backwards, mm -hmm. which is a little trickier in a chair. Do you have a trick for that? Well, what I usually will do is I'll have the person put a pillow between their shoulder blades and lean back against that. And that is just a really subtle heart opener. And it kind of reverses that spine from being slouched. So if I can elevate the spine with a pillow then they don't have to do the muscular work, but they're getting that same openness that then is going to shut down that nervous system and say, okay, I'm in a good place. Because, you know, studies have shown that the more we slouch, the higher our cortisol is. And But people that have straight postures, cortisol is much lower. So if we can get people to have I'll sit <laughs> straight up all spines, now. <laughs> then they're going to feel in a good place. And then typically how I finish the class is I will have people put their hand on their heart and I will often put my hand over their hand and say, let's just breathe together. Watch me. We're going to blow out a birthday candle. And so birthday candle they've done. It's familiar. If I tell them a yoga pranayama practice, it's going to go. And so, you know, breathe a candle with me. And then I'll say, will you put your hand on my hand on my heart? Can you feel my heart beating? And then our hands are on each other's hearts. And that is powerful. And that removes diagnoses for a moment. It removes confusion for a moment. And we're just in it to be together. And I think that's what feeds me so much is just that connection to seeing somebody who might be you know, I'm sleeping, I'm grumpy, sitting taller, breathing better, excited about smelling the aromatherapy. Um, there's just something that's magic that happens when you see someone and you don't see diagnoses, you don't see what they've lost. And I tell people all the time, our, our most important human need is to be seen and not being seen as somebody who has had four hip surgeries and has chronic pain or who is a mom of a person with a disability. Like those are valuable parts of me, but I want to be seen for the essence that I am. And so I in turn do that with every person that I come across. I don't want to just, in fact, my practice is to not know what their diagnosis is or how they obtained a brain injury, unless it is going to affect what I'm going to work on. I don't want to know because I want to know them today. I, obviously through practice and communication with them over months, I learn about their life. I learn what their history was, maybe where their accident came, maybe what their diagnosis is, but it's not my first question. My first question is, what do you love? Tell me about you. What color are your eyes? What, what makes you feel good in here? And that has nothing to do with their diagnosis. So. That's a good, that's a good recommendation just for, visiting, engaging, you know, because when I was, so my dad took care of my mom for the majority of her disease progression. And then he passed away. He passed away three years before she did. And mm -hmm. when I became responsible for her, it was always like trying to do the, you know, there was always like this 
urgency or a stress to like do all the right things for her and all the you know important mm -hmm. things connect engage get her outside get her doing things she used to love but simplified and holy crap 90 percent of that did not work and i don't yeah. know and i've because she's been gone for four years i wasn't sure if it was you know looking backwards is obviously much clearer than when you're in the moment i always wondered i'm like is it like my energy is what's putting her off because she was very creative and so i have talked to numerous art therapists and they all gave suggestions of what to do with her and she basically refused to do them um did them very reluctantly and i was like i don't understand why this is such a failure <laughs> like we are we are spectacularly failing at all of this advice <laughs> and i think it might have been the energy and approaching her the way you do she also thought i was her best friend so that mm -hmm. that made it tricky because it was hard to think of myself that way but yeah. that's how she saw me so i always thought of it as kind of an upgrade you know best friend is not exactly a, <laughs> a negative thing so i think if i had approached her the way you do we might have had more success at some of the other stuff which is kind of why i keep doing this show is because i keep learning best caregiving practices and right now the only soul that I quote caregive for is a four-legged golden retriever. <laughs> yeah. well, I think a lot of times what I witness by well-meaning staff or family members is when they come to visit or the staff, they're the individual who has dementia or Alzheimer is being told what to do. And there's not a lot of choice on their part to be able to say, they can say yes or no, but as far as like having choice in the activity, it's here, you need to eat, you need to get dressed, you need to go to the bathroom, you need to sit down, you need to put your blanket on, you need to give me that blanket. There's a lot of you need. And I try to come in from a whole different perspective of what can I do for you? And I need you to help me. And when I empower them to help me bake a cake, I can't tell you how many times I come back a week later and they say, how did the cake go? Like, <laughs> like that's crazy the things that they do remember blow me away and the cake and the frosting i do these little trials because they'll say i can't remember and so we repeat flour sugar eggs chocolate a zillion times and i'll say i just cannot remember what goes in this can you help me remember and then we go around the circle flour sugar butter eggs chocolate and pretty soon the whole group is remembering and we can't change the list it has to be the same order but that's okay that's okay because then in their mind they're like i can remember things i am valuable i think we they lose their value because their life was this and now they're sitting and watching prices right all day so how do we bring value to their day to day and i i do that by saying i need your help can you help me now that's excellent that's it's a good advice just in general for caregivers anybody dealing with somebody with a brain injury or some diagnosis of a dementia causing disease so that's yeah. an excellent tip um Thanks. thankfully the memory care that my mom lived in they didn't watch a lot of tv they did have activities and i was always surprised she was much more willing to do activities with them than she was with me which was yeah. very irritating but you know that's how it goes i'm sure but you know we always like direct our frustration at the people closest to us and we put up the most resistance to those that are closest to us so i think with her because she established some pretty good friendships um the listeners know my mom's name was diane she befriended diane s and they befriended diane r which of <laughs> course is super confusing i just referred to him as diane other diane and other other diane and every time you talk about making the cake i laugh because Diane S was a, she had a wicked sweet tooth. But we, <laughs> there was the first fall that my mom lived in memory care. They had a family, it was basically a family Thanksgiving, but I think they called it a harvest buffet or something. I don't know why they didn't call it Thanksgiving, but it was like the week before Thanksgiving. And they had a variety of desserts and Diane S would go, oh, I let me try some of these. So she'd pick up like two or three desserts now she was a taller lady i'm five foot two so it's not hard to be taller than me she was 
significantly taller than me and thin. And I'm thinking, nice that you can eat these desserts and not like waddle <laughs> out of here like 40 pounds heavier. And then like 20 minutes later, she'd be like, oh, I haven't tried any of these. And she'd take three more desserts. <laughs> but she absolutely loved chocolate was her favorite. I, the mm. first year my mom, the first birthday my mom had in memory care, I made a dark chocolate cake with chocolate mm. frosting. Diane S. would not let me take the plate the dish the cake dish uh because she had to like finger lick it lick clean it. <laughs> yeah. i mean at least she didn't like put her tongue on the dish that would have i mean that was That's she was awesome. close though she probably contemplated it but yeah and i will never forget her because she always told me that she was three days shy of a witch and her birthday Aww. was october 29th <laughs> so every, awesome. every october 29th i remember her because and i remember all the chocolate that she loved yeah yeah but I think that cool. the friendships is what helped my mom be more willing to do things. Because mm -hmm. once I was there, man, all she wanted to do was sit around and shoot the breeze. Yeah. Like, Ugh, really <laughs> difficult because she'd ask you a question. And I've recently learned. So my mom always said, so what have you been up to lately? And I thought it was a good answer to break up my day into like one, you know, oh, it's Monday. I went to the gym. Oh, it's Monday. I went to Rotary. Oh, it's Monday. I came to visit you. So I always had like a simple answer, but I've recently learned that by not answering it exactly the same, it was like not answering it at all. Mm. But after 20 minutes of answering the same question, <laughs> and then of course I would say, well, I've done X. What have you been up to? Oh, you know, same old, same old. Like <laughs> immediate conversation stopper. And it's like, you couldn't make something up, lady. <laughs> like, exactly. And that's what I was awesome. trying to engage her in other things that she just was not interested in doing. So we always went yeah. to the park or the pool or wherever to go watch kids. That worked mm. out really well. And she Sweet. was out in the sunlight and the fresh air. And there was just always just this slight, like just a little bit more brightness behind the eyes when we'd been outside for an hour or so. Yeah. It's so beautiful. That was, yeah, it was, it worked, you know, and I could, I got the same benefits from being, you know, outside. I could answer emails on my phone or just put my head back and enjoy the sun on my face, sure. you know, and just, just be together. I don't think I realized that that's what we were doing. So again, yeah. I keep learning great things. That's good. <laughs> don't have anybody currently that I use them on. So <laughs> that's okay. How would you encourage a caregiver to start like they they've, they've listened to you and now they're like oh i should i should try some of this because i think my grandma or my spouse or whoever i think they might be getting all stiff and cranky at the end of the day and maybe that's prompting some of the sundowning or some of the less yeah. desirable um, personality traits are coming out so how would you encourage them to to start because sometimes just getting think, started is the hardest part it is hard and i think I think one of the ways that I, when I walked into some of these places, not knowing anything about anything or anything about anybody is I just became very playful and almost childlike parallel with their childlike qualities. And so we would do something fun like the row, row, row your boat or, um, you know, stirring the cake and the frosting is very playful and fun. And then I would say, let's keep doing it and lift one leg. And then everybody gets off balance and we laugh and we start over. I think meeting them where they're at, we always say that in yoga, like you meet your students where they're at and you don't try to assume that they're going to be X, Y, and Z. You totally just see who they are as they are in the moment. And so if I see somebody who's like having a hard day, who's crying and refusing to do anything or spilling their water on purpose or being disruptive. Um, I will typically just sort of stop and shift gears and I'll say, Hey, let's look out the window for a second and redirect the thought, the thoughts from the train loop that they're on is, you know, whatever they're thinking about, they're on that loop. And so I will use something in the very present, look out the window. Um, luckily a lot of the homes I have have dogs living in them. And so I'll get the dog to come over and jump on their lap. Can you pet the dog for me? Let's look and see if his toenails are too long. And I just get them like tuned into what is right now. Um, so I think it's just being really creative and not feeling like you're telling them to do something, but asking them 
can you do this with me? And that with me kind of communication is so much different than you need. And what worked for my daughter way back in the day, I mean, I feel like now I see the reason (laughs) is instead of saying to her, if you do this, then you'll whatever. So if you eat, then you'll get to watch Prices Right. Or if you go outside with me, then you'll get to whatever. It's when you, then you. Because if is negotiable, they can say, no way, I'm not doing that. But when is like, I'm going to wait it out. And so when you, when you come sit down in the recliner, then I'm going to pull out my wild orange aromatherapy. Or when you sit down over here, then we're going to listen to your favorite music, which is Elvis. I've done yoga practices to more Elvis than I could ever (laughs) describe. I don't like Elvis, but you know, I'm meeting them where they're at, giving them something that they enjoy. You know, who's your favorite singer? Or I might know that from staff or favorite colors. I do things that I am almost certain that there's going to be some memory in there that maybe I could pull out, whether it's color or season or holiday or chocolate or vanilla or favorite music. We might dance if somebody can be up or they're wandering around the house and they don't want to sit down. I'll just say, hey, teach me how to dance. And I grab their hands and twirl around and I've reeled them in. There's no more of that resistance. So I think for a caregiver, you know, I can picture a daughter or a son or a granddaughter saying, come on, you need to do this. I think just shifting that and turning the dial just ever so slightly to let's do this together. Can you help me? then it becomes something that we're together on versus I'm telling you to do something that I want you to do. Because even without dementia, nobody wants to be told what to do. And so we resist that. You need to eat better. You need to, you know, whatever. We resist it. And so if we did it together, then I'm not alone in this journey. I have somebody who's partnered with me and I'll link arms with these people all the time. And, And there's just that tactile connection that, most of the touch these guys are getting is getting dressed, getting bathed, wiping food off their chin. And let me see your hands. Let me just see your hands. And I rub their hands. Well, everybody loves that. And so that has softened their edges. And they're getting that input into their nervous system that feels good. It feels comforting. It feels nurturing. It feels like love. Totally different. So I would... I would tell a caregiver to kind of bring out some hand lotion and say, you know, my hands are really dry. Can you help me? And then all of a sudden you've made that tactile connection. And then, you know, let's do this for a little bit, or let's do this. Let's go swimming. We go swimming and we throw fishing lines all the time. Anything that's meaningful to them. Do you have uh, moves for the men for baseball season, since that's what we're getting close to? (laughs) Oh we're yes, gonna duh. Throw. we're going to I was thinking of really the fast. umpire. <laughs> I don't yeah, know. No. I could probably google it, but I don't know. But you know, we go fishing. I could, I occasionally visit my mom in Florida and we talk about fishing and let's swim out. Let's swim out to the boat. We're going to get in the boat and then we're going to throw the line. I got a big one. Lean back and reel it in. Throw it again. And let's do the other arm. And so I just I make up 90% of what I do and it works. <laughs> I could see that. I was always reluctant yeah. to try to like physically engage my mom until I knew that she was ready. So I think that that's something I should have overcome. But I didn't, you know, again, didn't know better. This is why I yeah. still talk to people because I love you it. You know, I think after seven years, we'd run out of topics, but there's always a new twist. You know, I've done yoga for caregivers for stress release, and now we're talking about yoga, adaptive yoga for you know, engaging with our loved ones. So same topic, totally different conversations. Yeah, for sure. No, I love it. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to, they, um, the Peloton has adaptive classes. Um, for anybody who hasn't checked out this instructors, they're not all 20 something skinnies with, you know, long blonde hair and all that stuff. And you know, you were talking about the men being reluctant because, you know, it's weird girly stuff. And it's like the two yogis that I like the best are men. <laughs> <laughs> That's perfect. It's perfect. My favorite one always says, I make, I make suggestions, you make decisions. I love that. So mm-hmm. good. And we need yeah. to remember that just in our relationships 
outside of yoga is such a powerful thing to suggest. Yeah, and it's I think part of it's it's like, you know, they if you're doing the cycling classes, there's ranges of speed of pedaling and resistance. And so, you know, if you're not feeling that suggestion, then don't do it that way. Like there's wow. days when your body is like, no, cranky, you did a heavy yeah. leg workout yesterday. Why the hell are you riding a bike today? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. But yeah, I, I like, I try to keep that in mind. I make suggestions, you make decisions. Because that, that gives, Good. keeps all the power within yourself. So For what sure. is the what is the chat your YouTube channel called? I'll make sure that's in the show notes so people can check it out. Um, it's under Embracing Spirit Yoga. You could also find it under my name, but I believe it's Embracing Spirit Yoga. Awesome. You think it? It's like me. I always forget. <clears throat> they give you options. Embrace. They I'll do. That down. Well, this has been fantastic. It's, it's not exactly what I was expecting, but it's better. So that's really cool. Okay. I'll make sure to check out the the YouTube channel and um mine is I can't remember if it's Al Alzheimer's podcast or the Fading Memories podcast. You can find it probably under either. It's you know, they give you options to personalize things. Um they do. And then what is uh, you have a website as well. Make sure the audience knows about that one. Yeah, I do. Um my website's more for kind of just my day-to-day -day studio stuff. Um, I have a couple different things, but I'll make sure that you have those, those links um, talking about what I do and my philosophy. Awesome. Well, I appreciate this. I hope you're having better weather in Colorado than we're having in Northern California right now. Still waiting for the sun to come back and we had a little teasings of spring, but we're waiting for more. It's beautiful today. We, we awesome. get snow again, but it's beautiful. All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your podcasts.